ಓಂಜನಂ ನಿತ್ಯಮನಂತರೂಪಂ ಭಕ್ತಾಧೃತವಿಗ್ರಹ ವೈ ಈಶಾವತಾರ ಪರಮೇಶಮಿಟ್ಯಂ ತಮ ರಾಮಕೃಷ್ಣ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಅಂಡ್ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಟು ಅವರ್ ಸ್ಟಡಿ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಭಗವದ್ಗೀತಾ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಸ್ಟಡಿ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಥರ್ಟೀನ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಕಾಲ್ ಕ್ಷೇತ್ರ ಕ್ಷೇತ್ರಜ್ಞ ವಿಭಾಗ ಯೋಗ ದ ಯೋಗ through which we learn to separate the kshetra and kshetragna the field which is all of prakriti and kshetragna is the purusha so we have gone through some 10 12 <coughs> verses of it and today i thought maybe i'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the sankhya philosophy on which this whole gita teachings are based because we're using those terminologies ahankara buddhi mana chitta and all those things they come from a philosophy called the sankhya philosophy and uh, if you are not familiar with that then it doesn't make sense so today i thought i will just put a pause to this uh, sutra so the verses of the gita and just quickly take you through the sankhya philosophy the chart of it so that uh it begins to make sense so let's look have a look at that i have drawn up a little chart okay <clears throat> so this is a chart this sankhya philosophy sankhya means counting number it also means knowledge knowledge of reality how we classify the various ideas a uh, uh, classification is necessary because just like in chemistry we draw up a periodic table where we put all the elements in a way that according to their properties and that chart makes it very meaningful to understand something about those elements in there imagine we didn't have a chart everything was put in one bucket and we said there are so many elements so so much information would not be available the chart makes those things happen likewise when the vedic rishis they dive deep into themselves and then they came to various aspects of knowledge knowledge about the gross world knowledge about the subtle mental world knowledge about the consciousness and to communicate that to us they had to use some language some terminology some classification for the simple reason that the mind can only grasp limited things it has to define something and then it has to build up ideas and pictures with the help of those building blocks that's how the mind functions so the vedic rishis then tried to build up a structure of how the various entities they experienced are structured uh, or put together and arranged in a particular way this became and that particular classification is called the sankhya and they are called the sankhya means uh, these are the 24 cosmic principles so you say 24 the number is 24 and i have put up a chart there to show how they are all uh, uh, structured together and as i explained to you you'll find that we've been talking about all these things so at the very lowest level you see <coughs> uh, you have the mind in the five organs uh, of knowledge called gyana indriyas gyan indriyas which are the eyes ear nose skin and tongue these are not literally the physical eyes but they are actually the centers in the brain that are linked to the eyes and then we have got this five actions of action hands feet speech elimination and procreation then we have got this five tan matras which are called the subtle elements the senses the translation is not very good there so shabda sparsha rupa rasa gandha shabda is the sound sparsha is touch rupa is form rasa is taste gandha is smell and these five elements tan matras combine together to produce what are called the pancha mahabhutas shiti uh, aptesh marudvyam the five elements uh, earth air fire water and space so these five times four times five makes 20 20 uh, tattvas are there on top of them is mind which is 21st 21 ahamkara the sense of ego 
the second mahat is the cosmic intelligence of buddhi 23 and prakriti the unmanifest state of of being where everything all the three gunas are held in balance that's called the avyakta unmanifest it has contained it contains within itself the potency to manifest this whole universe but in that state those three gunas are balanced and that is called prakriti so if, as soon as krishna sri krishna started talking about the kshetra ahankara uh, uh, manabuddhi ahankara all those elements be, uh, begin to come he was talking about these prakriti so according to what sri krishna had described prakriti is the kshetra the field in which everything is happening and next to it on the left you can see is the purusha the soul the consciousness unlike the linkages that are shown between one tattva and the other below prakriti which shows an arrow a definite strong line showing how one is produced out of the other the prakriti is a very fine state and then it becomes slightly grosser and grosser until the physical world of matter and body around appears around and is experienced by us but the connection between the purusha and prakriti is not shown as a solid line is shown as a dashed line that means apparently it is there influencing the actions of the prakriti but really there is no definite connection and kshetra kshetragna vibhaga yoga really is about bringing about the disconnection that has somehow happened between the purusha and prakriti all right so the purusha is the kshetragna pure consciousness that is what we really are somehow by coming in close connection in proximity of prakriti <clears throat> by the consciousness of the power of the purusha the prakriti gets energized activated and then she undergoes various types of transformations through which she manifests all these various 24 cosmic principles and our sense of identity of who we are what we identify with somehow is lost or transfers transferred from the purusha element and it becomes identified with okay the buddhi is cosmic intellect or the i sense that is very strong in us and then it becomes identified with the physical body or the mind or the uh, senses that we the gyan indriyas or the five elements of the external world and that is how the purusha has lost its sovereignty its actual true nature and has become trapped and bound in is a prison of this body mind complex and this is what is called jivahood and that is how we are trapped in this so once we know the nature of the prison in which we are caught which is this body mind complex in the external material in the subtle walls also then we can try to retrace our path back and separate ourselves from all this so as we go through the uh, chapter 13 actually whole of bhagavad gita is basically trying to tell teach the same thing in different ways Uh, but here the sankhya philosophy the chart puts things in perspective and when we talk about those various uh, elements where sri krishna will later on will talk about gunatre vibhaga yoga he will say okay how do i how do we classify ourselves and everything around us in prakriti in our experience according to sattva rajas and tamas why is that classification necessary in the first place you may ask because uh, the roles of sattva and tamas and rajas are all very different sattva lifts up takes us towards the purusha self tamas takes us and keeps us anchored in the lower gross body rajas it is full of energy it just puts everything in motion and gets everything convoluted in there so we should know what are the three functions or the the properties of these three gunas this of which this whole universe is made right from prakriti through the mahat through the ego through the mind so in gunatre vibhaga yoga shri krishna will take each of these elements and say let us see when the mind is sattvic how does it function and it's rajasic how it's function and it's tamasic how is it function 
when the body is sattvic rajasic and tamasic when the food we take that is rajasic uh, sattvic and tamasic and when the ego is very sattvic how does it function that means it will be reflective and contemplative and calm and reflect the the glory of the purusha but when that same ego is very tamasic then you see it becomes materialized as yes, matter when it is rajasic then it is full of action and that's how we are trapped in this in the prison house of these three gunas it's very important to understand that we are trapped in this and as such we have forfeited our the infinite glory of the atman and reduced to a very limited being something that we've been studying in the kashmir shaivism in pratyabhijna hridayam those who are studying uh, are uh, attending those classes will see that in kashmir shaivism they don't talk about 24 cosmic principles they actually talk about 36 cosmic principles of which this 24 are a subset of that but after pragati it goes in much more detail and says how did this purusha land up in this pragati so that dash dash line that is there that is explained in more detail in kashmir shaivism where they say there this power comes maya with her five coverings and she brings about a uh, limitation of the universal being into a limited being and that's why we have been trying to study that particular philosophy because it takes us deeper uh, and gives a much clearer insight about how we are constituted and the little bit more detail comes in there so it's good from that perspective so this is the sankhya philosophy uh, keep this uh, uh this this uh, chart in your mind if you want to know more about it just go and do a search and on google and you'll find this similar charts are there some of them not very uh, accurate for example you see i have put a little black box there uh, and the reason that in this particular chart the author whoever designed it called it 25 tattvas 25 elements actually they're not 25 elements because purusha is not a tattva only from prakriti downwards it's a purusha uh, is a, uh, are counted the tattvas purusha is a separate entity altogether so sometimes you know various authors or people who don't have deep insight knowledge of this they will make these small mistakes but by and large you'll find quite a few charts like that and then the reason uh, how to look at this is after studying this classification then we reflect on to our own self and say okay how way am i and so i am aware of my body i am aware of my karma indriyas gyan indriyas i have a certain idea about the pancha mahabhutas the external world i am aware of the sense of mind that's where my identity is most of the time when i'm thinking and happy and happy feelings emotions i am i am is your ahankara that is where we are trapped do i have a buddhi in intellect most of the time i'm not very aware of it but uh, it is the fact it's a bridge between the ego and prakriti actually that needs to be developed and sadhana japa meditation is all about awakening that that mahat is actually a predominantly sattvic entity in in mahat in buddhi is transparent is reflective you can see a very good reflection of yourself so that's where the purusha is able to see himself and recognize himself so oh, this is what i am looking at but when he looks at himself in the body then all the glory of the infinite consciousness of the purusha is limited to the limited consciousness that we feel when it is reflected in the muddy mind so to say when this tamasic is like what is very muddy when this raj, rajasic it's very turbulent full of waves thoughts ideas confusion worries tension full of vrittis when it's sattvic it's very calm that's why we always try to promote sattvic nas in us by our thoughts our words our deeds and a spiritual aspirant would be very very alert about these type of uh, about promoting Uh, or, or increasing the sattvic element in themselves about what they eat what they think what they do what type of company they have and if you're not very careful about it then some you take one step up and two steps down and you don't make much success so a very clear understanding is necessary then we know 
what to do and what not to do to promote our spiritual well-being. So this is one chart. I found another one that I brought in there. Let me see. And so here's another one. And says the journey of consciousness into meta. How did this Purusha end up getting mixed up and become embodied? Somebody put a little bit of a interesting drawing. So there was a Purusha in Prakriti. These are the two primary elements. Somehow they get entangled into each other. So you see one is going clockwise, another one is going anticlockwise. And out of that entanglement comes Mahat. Mahat, not D, Mahat. Mahat is the cosmic mind. How do you understand that? Just like we have got this physical world, endlessly in every direction we see this matter and bundles of matter, whether it's a body or planet or galaxy. These are the what is contained in the physical world. In this finer world, in the subtle world, in the mental world, which we call the Chit Akasha. Uh, this physical world is called Maha Akasha. The subtle world is called Chit Akasha. It's the river or ocean of ideas and thoughts in which our own mind is a little whirlpool, you might say, into which ideas are coming from outside, getting caught in our own minds and then leaving us also. So really when you say I got an idea, basically some idea that is pre-existing that has been thought by others also enters into our sphere, our mind space and we become aware of it by focusing our attention onto it and we say, ah, there's a thought that has popped up in my mind and then before you know it has gone away and something else comes. All that is happening in the cosmic mind of which our own mind is a small part of it. And so uh, below you can see this uh, person has shown the sattva element and sattva is full of light, luminosity, rajas is full of activity and tamas is full of darkness. And out of each of those gunas, how the gross world has appeared, the ego inorganic world and the organic world there's another presentation. You'll find there are a lot of presentations where they're trying to catch the whole idea. Uh, but this is a presentation of the Sankhya philosophy. And it's good to know this because throughout the Gita, this uh, classification would be used, this terminology would be used. So with that in background, let us now go back to our class uh, notes and we were so i have created a version 3 of this and i'll upload that in our group where i have inserted this particular chart in there and uh, so when shri krishna starts us starts from verse number 5 mahabhutani ahankara so in that particular chart what were the mahabhutas the five elements ahankara is we saw how it is sitting on the in the Sankhya philosophy chart. Buddhi, Buddhi is that uh, intelligence that is sitting above Ahankara. Avyakta, Avyakta is the Prakriti. We are all the three gunas are in balance. So right from Prakriti onwards, everything is being sort of enumerated here and they all collectively form what is called the Kshetra, the field in which all this um, planting of the seed is, uh, the seeds are implanted and the world grows into it. Okay, Mahabhutani Ahankara Buddhi Avyaktam Evacha Indriyani. So, how many Indriyas? Thus Ekam, 10 plus 1, thus Ekam. What are they? The five organs of action, five organs of knowledge, plus the mind. In the chart we had seen, uh, how they are all at the same level. Mind is also considered to be an indriya, an organ. The saikamcha panchcha indriya gochara. Indriya gochara means that to which the indriyas are going out to. What are they? These are the pancha mahabhutas, five gross elements. So you see, in, in one verse, Sri Krishna has explained the whole, almost the 24 cosmic principles are there. That's nice. So, but it's not only the entities there, it is those changes that are happening in that is also 
So there are objects and there are processes. Whenever there's a flow of energy, some transformation is happening, that is also part of nature. Okay, so this, what are they? Icha, dvesha, a desire, uh, something that you are attracted to, I like it, your mind is resonating with it, you want it, it gives you joy. Dvesha, it's opposite, something that is repulsive, you don't like it, you hate it, you say, uh, you try to avoid it. Those are changes that are happening in the mind. How do we understand what is, uh, where does that joy or happiness that you feel, where does it come from? Apparently, you might think that I'm eating something or seeing something and that's giving me joy. But really, that's only a material thing. It doesn't itself contain joy. Joy is of the nature of the Purusha. So what happens, all these are coverings, right from Prakriti, Ahank, uh, Mahat, Buddhi, Ahankara, Mana, and all the five senses of knowledge and action and physical body, all are different layers, one on top of the other, like an onion, and becomes thicker and thicker and thicker. And so what happens? The pure light of the Purusha doesn't flow out so nicely, fully. And depending on how these different layers are constituted in different people, on that will depend uh, how much light shines out. So those who are very sattvic in body-mind will find oh, the divine beauty, what I call the Daivi Sampatti. Elsewhere, Sri Krishna talks about the Asuri Sampatti and Daivi Sampatti. The divine qualities are when the inner light of intelligence and beauty and purity and goodness and all this uh, wonderful divine excellence shine forth. And when these three gunas are predominant with Rajas and Tamas, then that light, even though it's present in equal measure in all of us, its manifestation is less. So the difference is made by how these three gunas are constituted or how our bodies, minds are constituted out of these three gunas. So Icha Dvesh, these are two uh, waves in the mind. And one is where you feel something good, Sukha and Dukha. Sukha is happiness, Dukha is misery. What happens? So when we understand this philosophy, we know how to apply it in our life and say, joy or happiness actually is a property of the Purusha. When that is obscured, covered, and there is less light, less of that joy, that becomes an experience of misery. You feel, you know, you had a better state of happiness and now some of that has been reduced. So you feel in that state of mind you call, uh, uh, unhappiness, uh, dukkha. And if you do some particular work through thought, word or deed that makes a change in your mind by which that covering is removed and suddenly the inner light flashes out more, that state you call, oh, I'm so happy, I'm joyful. In ignorance, people will think that, oh, that nice food I ate, that is making, giving me joy. Okay, some ice cream I'm eating, that is making me giving me pleasure but really pleasure is the nature of the atman it's the bliss of the atman that eating of that rasgulla or ice cream or whatever seeing a beautiful flower or some experience temporarily removes that obscuration that blockage uncovers and the inner light shines forth so when people lack discrimination they will attribute that uh, ex good experience to something external and they say let's have some more of it. When the soul matures, that buddhi element becomes sharper and clearer, then it is able to understand or even through the scriptures and internal reflection, it is able to say, ah, oh, it's not out there. Certain things help me manifest my inner light, certain things help uh, cause the covering and therefore let me work on the process of discovery. So, uh, so here, Icha Dvesha Sukham Dukham Sanghata Chetana Dhriti. Dhriti is fortitude. There's another property. To be able to hold on to something in persevere. When your perseverance is not there, then in any effort, we, we give up after some time. And Sanghata is when anything comes together. It's a, a putting things together. There's a book called Sankhya Karika. And there's a sutra that we study and it says 
Sanghata Pararth Tattve. Whenever some couple of things are put together, assembled, it is for the joy and benefit of somebody else. For example, if, if you cook food by you know, putting various uh, things in the, uh, in the dish, somebody else will enjoy it. A carpenter will build a house, somebody else will live in it. So when this whole body is constructed or anything that is constructed, it is for the benefit and the pleasure of somebody else. This whole physical body in the universe is constructed for the pleasure of the Atman to reflect itself, so to say. That's a little bit of philosophy on the side. Etam Shetram Samasena, Samasena in totally, in brief. These things that I have listed, says Sri Krishna, these are called Shetra, the field, right from Prakriti all the, all the way. Savikara Mudahritam. Okay. So then uh, he goes and and he begins to talk about something else. He does not immediately go and start talking about the Purusha. Purusha is too subtle. In between is the mind that has to be dealt with. The mind either is taking us up or down and he is going to talk about those types of changes which we call Chitta Vrittis. Uh, vritti means a change, a whirlpool, an idea, a thought that appears in the Chitta. Chitta word we are using, let me explain that also because that's important. Chitta means the mind stuff. The mind stuff is like um, the, if you say, imagine there's a little block of jelly, okay. In that jelly, you are uh, touching it. When the moment you touch it, the whole thing shakes and vibrates. Some changes happen in there. Those changes are called Chitta Vrittis thought waves, energy has been injected into it and the, that is creating some vibration and chain inside that. And if it is very low level frequency, then the light doesn't pass through. If it's a very high level frequency, it becomes transparent sort of thing. So that is called Chitta. And the Chitta is made of all types of vrittis, thoughts and they are, even the experiences that we have every moment. Uh, they are left and they leave the impressions and these are called the samskaras. And samskaras are impressions that we have collected from all thoughts, words and deeds, experiences from the moment we were born till now as well as what we have brought in from the previous lifetime. When we die, only the physical body dies. The mind does not die. The chitta does not die. It carries along the whole bundle. Eh, the le kar aata hai, that leftover whatever was inherited from our previous lifetime we bring only the body is changed so the whole purpose of sadhana is we'll find this word chitta shuddhi purification of the mind that chitta that has become so uh, full of all this worldly desires or conditioned by the external world itself becomes the prison house in which we are caught. And the process of liberation is about reducing the tamas, reducing the rajas, promoting the sattva, eventually going beyond the three gunas uh, and be freed. And that is the state of uh, being united with Purusha. In Sankhya philosophy, that's called Kaivalya. The Purusha abides in its own pure glory it has nothing to do with the prakriti and all that. And then uh, jiva is when the purusha has got mixed up. Purusha and prakriti have come together and now there's all this drama of this world. So these qualities that will lift the mind towards the purusha, that is called jnana here. And Sri Krishna lists them. And now, since we have got that idea about the structure of the elements, how they are uh, put together on the chart of the Sankhya philosophy. As we quickly run through this, you will find that Sri Krishna is trying to tell us to put into practice those types of ideas and thoughts that will lift the mind upwards towards, towards uh, the buddhi element, towards the prakriti, towards the purusha and not take it down. If this idea, uh, his understanding is not there, then many a time people will put into practice 
uh, go towards the west thinking they are going east okay they will engage in the material world thinking that it's a spiritual practice sort of say so <clears throat> what are they humility amanittam what's the utility of that well humility means you are not trying to promote your own ego its opposite is when we are arrogant full of pride egotistic then that is not conducive to a spiritual growth so humility even if you have lot of knowledge and all those things huh, one has to not go on boasting about themselves amanittam adambhitvam unpretentiousness you don't go around telling you your own glories uh, or don't want to get somebody else to proclaim your own glories you know so nowadays it's very offensive somewhere you go get invited people will ask for your bio data and then the minister or somebody lists all everything which he wants to be read out as an introduction to the whole audience again and again he wants uh, his glory to be proclaimed a spiritual sikha says no we come across this problem sometimes we get invited to some place and immediately somebody will say swami ji can you send us your bio data we don't have a bio data or anything like that so we just tell we i am only a swami of the ramakrishna mission that is all the identity that we have most of the people are not very happy with that they want to tell you where you came from and everything so then next is ahimsa so himsa is when you do harm to somebody else in thought word and deed ahimsa is when you abstain from that now why would you not do harm to somebody else if we are going to aim for a universal experience of self realization then we are trying to find our identity with the ocean but on the surface of the ocean there are so many waves which are all this individual sex y and z when they are not aware of the underlying connectivity of the ocean then they think these are other people there and that's where people fight they compete they exploit they harm others thinking that they are others but from a spiritual perspective the perspective of the ocean you have that these are all my own selves these are i am the ocean they are my own waves and therefore i should not harm or hurt anyone else so that is the sort of a rational way why we would not do harm to others is it possible to live in this world without causing some harm to somebody else the answer would be no if you want to be say i will have an existence where no harm will come from me then you know how can you survive uh, you might say intentionally and not doing but your existence demands that some suffering would be there with somebody else if you say i am just not eating animals i am looking at plants plants do have life so so you might say uh, i am i has bought some rice uh, and i paid for it and it's all very sattvic food but you know there is a poor farmer in india who is there working on his field whipping his bullock and all those things and all that suffering happens as a result of which you are getting that food so this world is very very complicated connected and interconnected where it's almost impossible to live a life without indirectly or directly hurting anyone else here what it means intentionally directly one should not do that but those things the injury that comes to others unintentionally does that affect us of course it affects you it is very very subtle very very difficult to uh, do that so that's why our in our scriptures our teachers will say since it is not possible to live a life without in some way or the other bringing some suffering to somebody or not therefore we should repay that debt to the world by giving something back in return and these are the panch maha yagnas that every householder should or uh, every person should do some degree of success sacrifice that you will give you know, to the world in return and settle the debt so to so to say and, and th these are the teachings in there you might ask uh, swami ji how does this thing work uh, this karma thing you know i didn't intentionally do any harm to somebody i did not know how can that effect come to me well let me tell a little story uh, uh, teaching the gospel of sri ramakrishna i don't say that i'm going to explain to it but i'm just going to narrate to you uh, how alert and careful we need to be when dealing with these things 
So Sri Ramakrishna was uh, in the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. He said that once a person, a butcher was taking a cow to be slaughtered. You know, maybe a Muslim, either something is coming around and he was taking it uh, to his home. It was a hot day and he became very tired. And uh, he, on, just uh, on the journey as he was going past, he, there was a house of his Indian friend. At his home, he had some function, ritualistic puja, something. So this guy goes and ties uh, the cow to a tree, goes to his friend's house, has a meal, takes a rest, and then carries on his journey, goes home and slaughters the cow. Now the sin of that killing the cow, Gauhatya, when the cow was killed, of course went quite a bit to the person who did the killing, but it also went to this person who gave him the feast. He had no clue that he had brought the cow. He had no party to it. And yet somehow, just because he gave him a meal, a part of that came to him. How do you explain that? I have got no how to explain it. That the word in the Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna says, Gahana Karmano Gati. The path of action in this world is very, very intricate. We do not know how we are connected and interconnected. Even if we do not know things, it is affecting our mind. Therefore, one has to be very, very alert because this world is connected and interconnected. And, and what happens out there affects us, and what we do affects the world. So, uh, I thought I will just narrate that. So, Amanitvam, Adam Bhittvam, Ahimsa, Shantir, Arjavam. Shantir is uh, forbearance. Forbearance, forbearance, forbearance. That is the secret of peace of mind. If you don't forbear, uh, it's a problem. So, what does it mean according to our Sankhya chart? Well, constantly the external world is impinging on us, trying to draw our mind across, out there. Maybe neighborhood or people or climate or uh, politics or government or whatever is happening. They are troubling us, hassling us all there. It could be your own body. Some health is not very good. Or your mind, uh, thoughts and things are not there. So all of them try to unsettle us, disturb our peace of mind. And in the midst of all this, how do we maintain that balance? If we begin to react to these worlds, then we are caught in that. They will drag us out. You have a conversation, you got a fight or whatever is there. But if you say all that would be a waste of time and dissipation of important, useful, very precious energy and time, let me just put up with that for the time being and they themselves will disengage and leave me in peace. That attitude of not engaging and fighting back and whatever you want to say with the world and just putting up with that is called forbearance in Vedanta it's called titiksha. Sahanam sarva bhutan sar, sahanam sarva dukhanam apratikara purvakam. Sahanam sarva dukhanam. It's very simple to understand. Sah sarva dukhanam, all types of suffering. Apratikara purvakam. Without trying to redress them, without trying to solve them. Just forbear. That is a tremendous spiritual discipline. It strengthens the mind, it strengthens the will willpower and you don't react to the world you, re you respond to it in a measured way but don't react to it otherwise we get caught by that so that's a very important discipline all these things are now preparing the mind to prevent it out its outgoing flow the energy mental energy that's flowing out so we are trying to arrest that then the idea is to harness that energy and turn it around and direct the mind towards the purusha. So you'll find there's a definite purpose behind all this. So Ahimsa we talk about Shanti, Arjavam, sincerity or straightforwardness. So this is another very important quality and we'll find that most people do not practice Arjavam. Arjavam means straightforwardness. What is in your mind? What's in your heart, what's in your mind should be what comes out of your mouth. There should not be any duplicity. There should not be any hypocrisy in a spiritual life. Because if the mind is constantly doing that, because you want to please everyone, because you want to be politically correct and all those type of things, then that mind develops this habit of fooling itself, cheating itself. And if you're, if you're not sincere within, in your external dealings, how can you be 
uh, since you have in your internal dealings because it's the same mind that's being engaged in the external world which will be engaged in the internal world so it's not there's a different mind at the time of meditation if it's trained in a wrong way in our external engagements by not being sincere that same mind will take you for a ride inside in your spiritual practices and fool you around also thinking taking one for the other so this is very very straight for Sri Ramakrishna would put a lot of attention to this he would say in Bengali Mon Muk Ekkara it means whatever you speak through your mouth you speak through your mouth your speech then whatever you feel in your heart your mind let there be harmony between the two there should not be any duplicity you might say Swamiji if I go around telling everything that I feel in my mind to people that is going to create a lot of problem for me and people will because people don't want to be told the truth one thing and people want to tell what it what pleases others even if it's false it's not true so that's how we live in a world uh, you go to some place somebody's and they give a food maybe it's so nice but you are forced to say how nice it was and this and that or somebody gives you a gift and you don't really need it but thank you very much, you know, I was so nice of you. All that is just playing around with these things. What do you do? Uh, maybe you keep quiet. Don't say anything. Don't express yourself. That's better than having that duplicity. It's very, very difficult. That is why working on the spiritual path has been compared to working on the razor's edge. Churasya dhara nishata durataya. Durgam patastat kavayo vadanti. Churasadhara, the edge of a razor blade. Nishita, Nishita means extremely sharp, very difficult to work. So one cannot be very casual and try to humor and please the world and everything at the same time, work uh, the spiritual path. You'll find that it's almost impossible. That's why you have to uh, sometimes make a break for it. So, <clears throat> Shantir Arjom, Acharya Opasanam Socham worship or service of the spiritual teacher it's not that the spiritual teacher wants any service from you or something it is basically an attitude of mind where you express your gratitude for the knowledge that comes through that channel and the source is not the spiritual teacher it's he's only the channel the very precious the great teachers who, who who experienced all those truths and captured them in the scriptures they are the ones uh, we we express our gratitude to and it's not giving some service to that person the best thing you can do in your gratitude is to practice those things what your guru or teacher has given you uh, not in a physical service it's actually sincerely doing your sadhana your japa and meditation that's the best thing you can do socha means purity purity of the body purity of mind purity of deed, purity of intention. You'll find that in the Gunatre Vibhaga Yoga later on, Sri Krishna talks about these things in more detail. And Stheriam Atma Vinigraha. Stheriam Steadiness, Perseverance. If you don't have the Sthirata, today you do this, tomorrow you do that, then nothing happens in life. You have to have that patience and steadiness because uh, you don't succeed in the one single attempt. You have to keep on hammering on the same hard wall and if you persevere then the nail will penetrate into the world so those people who are not steady who don't have this uh, they keep on doing all this window shopping today they do this tomorrow they do that Sri Ramakrishna talks about some farmer who wants to dig a little well in his backyard he digs in one place and after a meter he hits some stone then he said oh this is very hard let me get another place and then he digs another one and same problem and he keeps on changing at the end of the day he doesn't get any water he gets only so many holes in his backyard that type of window shopping in spirituality we find everywhere people go to some teacher and say can i have this mantra they do some practice no stherium after some time they give up and and they go to another one say can and i have had this all this wonderful funny conversation especially in the west uh, so they have two mantras three mantras then i ask them what do you practice oh swamiji I have just combined the two or three and made one more of my own, but this also is not working. Can you give me one? So this type of instability in spiritual practices, digging the well in many places, 
lot of effort, waste of time, not getting anywhere because that Shraddha is not there. The faith in the teacher, the teaching is not there. So they can't hold on to that. In spiritual practice, uh, for a spiritual um, seeker, Stherium is a wonderful uh, quality to have. Atma Vinigriha, control of the body and the organs. So we saw in the Sankhya chart, the, the five Jnanindriyas and Karmindriyas, what are they do? They, what do they do? They either take the mind outwards to the external Panch Bhutas or they become identified with the body. In either way, the ego or the eye sense is anchored at a very gross level. That's why Atma Vinikriha, controlling of this body and mind. Freedom from the senses, free, not freedom of the senses. We all want freedom, but in this Western world, eh, in America, crazy people, they think in the name of freedom, they can go around doing anything. Along with freedom can, comes great responsibility. The two should be together. One of our Swami said that they have got the Statue of Liberty, symbolizing freedom on the East Coast. On the West Coast, they should build another statue and call it Statue of Responsibility. So in everything where both these things should be balanced. So, but in spiritual life, this restraining the outflow of the energy through the mechanism of the body-mind is the first thing. Dissipation of energy is constantly wasted. Nothing, you got nothing to do anything, um, any higher to do with that. It's about first arresting the outflow of that energy, then doing sadhana to reconvert that energy into spiritual energy. That energy is called ojas and that is the, the, the one that uplifts us. So then comes Indriyarsha, Indriyartheshu Vairagyam. Vairagyam means dispassion. Indriya Artheshu, Artha means sense objects, something to see, something to eat. So the senses have this tendency to constantly go outwards, restraining that Vairagyam. Anahankar Evacha, absence of egotism. Even if one has got a lot of knowledge, you have made some spiritual progress, one should not become very, very egotistic because then again we fall in the trap of this prison house of the Jivahur. Indriyartheshu Vairagyam Anahankara Evacha Janma Mrityu Jara Vyadhi. So here comes discrimination. Dukh Dos Anudarshanam. What to do? Reflect on the defect, evil, dosha. When you see somebody's doses, we see the faults. Something is wrong with that and you don't want something that is faulty. So here is this body. It is very a faulty mechanism, so to say. It's not going to lead us. Uh, it's not the highest state of being, so to say. Because it is subject to Janma and Mriti, birth and death. Jara means aging, old age. Yeah, the youth is all nice, but after some time, they, the hair becomes white and the skin shrivels and all the energy becomes dilapidated, uh, dissipated. That is the nature of everything that uh, in this world, jara. Vyadhi is disease. Dukkha is full of misery. Dosh anudarshanam. See that. So basically, we are constantly going to remind ourselves that this is not the highest state of being. I should not want to stay in here and I should not want to return to it. But the method is not by destructing, destroying this body like sometimes people in the Western world do. They think life is too painful, let's destroy that. They will land themselves in a worse situation than, uh, than they are now. The method of escaping is to realize this divine nature, not destroying the mechanism of this body-mind by suicide or something like that. So this is a spiritual practice, being always being alert understanding that we are in a prison house and that freedom is the goal. So you see, in the list of all this, what Sri Krishna will classify as Jnana, he is trying to give us those practices and we have to remind them, uh, practice them, always be alert about them and through that the outgoing or the outgoing tendency of the mind by which it becomes entangled with the body and the external world we are trying to reverse engineer that so that it now becomes free and it can rise up towards the Purusha.
that changing of that direction is very very important spiritual life begins with that little change otherwise what we will do is we will drag the high ideal of spirituality at the gross level and therefore you'll find teachers how to find success in life through spirituality so you see those type of talks and things are there and people say ah, i like that type of religion that's very nice i can enjoy this world and still be spiritual what they do is they lower the ideal they drag it down to a very material level and of course a lot of people who just love that because that is what suits them and tunes them others are there who said no it's not about lowering the ideal but it's about lifting it mind up religion is that power swami vivekananda says which transforms a brute into a man and a man into god it's an uplifting power and we should never drag those high high ideals and say uh, let's practice uh, spirituality and this and that so that we are successful in business and have good health and this and that that is not the goal of spirituality that comes success and all those things will come on its own as a byproduct but that is not the actual goal of it so there it goes like this and uh, is it this it's important to i'm putting a little bit of emphasis on this because the other day somebody asked so what shall we do well you practice these things these are things to be practiced and you have to pay attention to those details as much as possible uh, in our everyday life so as you go around doing your work your cooking eating drinking treating patients teaching serving customers in the midst of all these things to have the uh, a degree of alertness that my whole experience should be about seeking this freedom the idea of freedom is has to be very very uh, strong it's only when you understand that you're in a prison house that you will understand the need for freedom but if you don't understand that you're in this prison then the idea of freedom does not come and let me tell a nice story today uh, to end this up and you'll we'll continue with this verses next time so some of might have heard this before but as uh, others for others it's new so there was one in some particular country there was a big zoo very large zoo and you know, maybe a thousand acres and all that very old zoo for hundreds of years it was there uh, with a huge big tall fence concrete wall all around it and the speciality of the zoo was that it was full of lions in there so now and then they would catch some wild lion from other parts of the world and release him into this jungle and one fine day they go to an african jungle line caught the guy from the bush and brought him out reverse the truck open the gate let him out and then they close the gate and this guy finds himself in a new place is wondering what is this all about and uh, you know uh, it's a friendly place or so what type of people or other lions or creatures are here and as i was thinking he saw three lions approaching him all the way he was frozen he didn't know what to do and they came to him and said hello welcome to paradise zoo and we are the reception committee our job is to take welcome our newcomers and take them and show them around well the jungle lion was very happy to see that they are all friendly guys and relieved so i said okay come along follow us so the tour starts the orientation tour of the new home and so this jungle lion is having a totally different experience compared to his bush jungle that he was used to uh, they were going along a nice path which was all paved uh, and he saw there was a big tree under that tree there was a big old line and in front of him there were 20 cubs sitting in straight rows and listening to him this old fellow was talking something and she asked the jungle line asked what is this uh, that is our education system you know we have learned so many things through many many generations and we want to transfer this knowledge to the youngsters so that they become useful members of our society this is called our education system and the jungle line reflected in our bush we have to learn on our own hard experiences this is so nice he thought so they went further and they came across a valley where there were two groups of lions sitting on different sides and they're shouting and jumping a couple of fellows were sit jumping in the middle there was all this commotion and he asked what is this so he said that is our parliament you know those are the 
ruling party and the opposition and they are debating about this most of the time they are fighting only but they make the policies and we all follow them and that is there's a governance system is there there's a rule of law and everything you can't just do anything and everything like in the jungle this jungle land was so amazed he said wow this is fantastic as they walked along they came across now and then some very hefty strong lines standing here and there so what are these oh that's our security our police force just to make sure that no one steps out of the line anyway all these things are happening along they came across that finally to a place where some very old elderly lions are sitting there relaxing in the sun and what is this this is our old age home we take care of our old fellows who have saved us well anyway in this way he was going seeing one thing after the other and getting extremely impressed about this order this system this you know everyone has but a role to play and everything is so nice and organized until he came finally to one another lion who is sitting there alone uh, looking at the wall and keeping quiet and out of curiosity this jungle lion asks him what about that guy he doesn't seem to be involved in any of these activities anything wrong with him and this guy said you know we do not know he doesn't talk to us much yeah he just keeps to himself and most of the time he is just alone and looking at the wall and this and that and they thought let's play a joke with him he said why don't you go and ask so this young guy uh, the new guy you know he's all very uh, adventurous he goes and says hello sir uh, i'm just new here i'm seeing having this wonderful experience my guides are showing me everything around wonderful work you know i can't imagine in my jungle where i come from everything is all chaotic uh, so your education system your governance your security your how you take care of your elderly and everything and everyone is seeing seems to be doing something uh, and, and active has got a role so i asked my friends about you and they said they have got no clue what you are doing may i ask you why are you sitting here all alone and and not just joining those so that old lion was sitting alone he said uh, yeah they are all foolish people there so he was reflecting what is so foolish about education and governance and taking care of the society and making everything nice here why does this fellow call them fools so he asked say i saw all these things they're nice things they're doing why are you calling them fools then the lion replies they're doing everything except the most important thing so he tries to reason in his mind what is more important all these things seem to be important then he asks can you please tell me what is the most important thing and the single the solitary lion says the most important thing is to find out a way to get out of this zoo and that's why i'm trying to look at the wall and find out a way those who are awake to the idea of freedom will only find freedom the others will go on constructing this prison prison house and wanting to return to this so this world is like that zoo and we come into it we have got all these rules society has got a map for success get educated get married get house car children educate them this and that tick all the boxes you are successful you have contributed nicely to the society you retire goodbye and people think that's it that is all about living happily in that zoo you have been a good member of the zoo that's what the certificate is all about they might celebrate that in the eulogy at the time when you die he was a good person he did did, did this all thing but the question is did he work on his freedom did he might manage to get become free that was the whole purpose of coming into this world so where do we classify ourselves doing all the nice things and keeping busy and contributing and making this world nice and perfect and all those things or understanding that no matter how nice it is no matter how beautiful it is at the end of the day it is only a prison house a golden chain it's a chain nonetheless and we understand that the discrimination comes then one wants to seek that freedom which lies beyond the walls of this world and that's why swami vivekananda says Vedanta is the voice of freedom. They alone become free who are awake to the idea of freedom. In the modern American way, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. Those who are extremely vigilant all the time to that idea of mukti, freedom, 
to regain that wonderful glory of the Atman. They only will try to make uh, seek freedom. The others would be very, very happy with this world. Everything is nice. Sat kuch set hai Swamiji, as they say in Fiji. By God's grace, I've got this, I've got that, and all those things. By God's grace, I'm enjoying my time in the prison house. That's the equivalent statement. So it might seem a little bit of, you know, doesn't might gel with everyone, but that is the truth. The truth is that the Purusha, the Atman, is a ever free being. Mitte Shuddha Buddha Mukta. That is our divine birthright. And the world is constantly trying to whack us in teach us that method. We try to find happiness in this world, it gives a little bit and then it gives you a nice blow and say it's not here. We want to find peace here, she gives a little bit, the Divine Mother. Prakriti is the great mother teacher and we are trying to find ourselves in her. She is saying, no, it's, you are not here, you are the Purusha, you are a separate being. And after a lot of getting whacked around in this world, coming again and again, the soul becomes wiser and says, I'm not going to find happiness here happiness is within me and then the return process starts and he wants to see how to not build the wall of this prison house but how to break it and escape that grapes escape is called mukti liberation nirvana self-realization god realization all different words are there that's the aim and purpose of life Thank you very much. Today we'll continue from here, but please go through these, uh, these qualities, the ones to be practiced and reflect on each one of them. And let those ideas become alive. If you think deeply, then when you are in a particular situation, and uh, they will pop up in your mind and say, this is how you should be doing and this is not how you should be doing. So it has to come out of the book. It has to enter your mind. It has to be processed. It has to be make, made alive and let there be on the providing the guidance about how we regulate our thoughts, words, and deeds in the midst of the various affairs of this world. We will... Swamiji, um, yes, uh, the qualities that you talked about, um, uh, you know, humility and and mm. others. I don't remember exactly all all of it, but is it possible for you to upload those from where? In the um, in the study circle, so that you because mean, I want to just keep that as uh, one of the references that would really help me. So this day. this particular so text that I'm mindful of the, this this particular text is it, that sharing it is there already. Um, okay. So if you okay. go, who is this speaking? Samiran, is it? No. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Samiran. So you go to the group, uh, that uh, Gita study group, and there you will find a tab called documents. Under that document, you can download this. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's see, I'll, I will put it in the share document. You probably will get in an email link. Thank you. All right. Anyone else has got a question to ask now for the next time? Very nice. We will see you next Thursday. Om Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Vrityorma Amritam Gamaya Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tatsat Shri Ramakrishna Arpanamastur